Hello, everyone. This is Pastor Keith, and I am here with you on Wednesday. Oh, it's March 31st, the last day of the month. Where did it go? Yeah, where's the year gone, right? We can ask those questions for, well, we're going to be asking those for a long time, aren't we? But not right now. This is the fourth day of Holy Week, Palm Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And this is what Mark, who details out what happens every day of the week, this is what Mark is saying happened on Wednesday. Mark 14, 1 through 11. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him, for they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. They scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. And so ends the fourth day in Holy Week, Wednesday. And what a day. The stage is set now for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's, it's, ready, it's ready to go. Some people call this the story of the first believer. The first believer. What about all the others? What about all the disciples who've been following Jesus, especially the 12 apostles? Well, in Mark, the theme is really, and if you read Mark, you can read Mark in about an hour and a half if you just have at it. It's a good short one sit down kind of read. In Mark, you wonder if the disciples are ever going to get it. Will they ever understand what is going on, who Jesus is, and what he is about? Take the three passages where Jesus predict, predicts his death. Mark 8.31, where he says he must go to Jerusalem, suffer and die. And Peter rebukes him, and Jesus rebukes Peter. And that word rebuke is a very serious word in the ancient Greek. It means, ooh, get behind me, Satan. Which is what Jesus said to Peter. Then in Mark 9.31, the disciples, when Jesus gets to, he says, what are you guys talking about and they are really quiet because they were arguing over who is the greatest among them. And you can see Jesus sighing and he brings a little child and puts it in the midst and says, whoever becomes like this little child and a servant to those children, they will be the greatest in the kingdom. Not what the disciples wanted to hear and they weren't getting it. And then Mark 10, 33 and following, James and John, the two fishermen from Capernaum, 
one of the first called by Jesus. James and John come to Jesus and say, we want to sit one at your right and one at your left hand when you come into your glory. And he says, you think you can do that? And they go, oh, yeah. And he says, then you must go be a servant. And as a servant, go to the cross. And they didn't get it. They just don't get it in the story of Mark. But the crowds, the Jewish peasantry, for want of a better phrase, the middle class of the Jews. They're not, they're not the, the down and out poor. They're not the homeless. They're the middle class of the ancient world. Kinda, they kind of get by. They take great delight in Jesus. They get it. They know what's going on. He's talking about the reign of God coming not through warrior kings or imperial powers, not even in rebel zealots, not through violence. They take great delight in him, like he did on Tuesday, yesterday, arguing and totally outwitting the scribes and Pharisees and elders and uh, who else? Scribes, Pharisees, elders, Herodians, Sadducees, chief priests. They get it. They know what he's about. He's wrecking their income. He's wrecking their control. And so right at the start of this day, the chief priests and scribes are looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. Because they know if they do it in front of the crowds, the crowds will rise up. There will be violence. And Rome will come and shut the whole game down. They'll lose their jobs, their great cushy life, and their income. And a lot of the Jewish peasants will die. So they must find a way to stealthily arrest him and execute him. So Wednesday, in the middle of all this, at dinner in Bethany, in the home of an outcast, some guy named Simon the leper, a woman, unnamed and unknown. There's all sorts of thoughts about who she might be, but basically an unnamed and unknown woman brings some ointment and anoints Jesus' head with it. 300 denarii. That's about a year's worth of wages. That's incredibly expensive perfume. And she prepares Jesus for burial. Because as a woman, they won't let her at the tomb. Not right away. And as a woman, she may not even get to be at the cross. But she gets it. She understands that Jesus is going to die. You have a practical disciples want to give it, you know, to uh, social service, outreach, helping the poor. Good, worthy, a just cause. But Jesus says, at this point, worship of me is important. Honoring my death is important. She gets it. And then that last verse or two, the last paragraph of 10 and 11, verse 10 and 11, Judas Iscariot, who is one of the 12, it doesn't say he was a thief like it does in Matthew or that he had zealous rebel interests or that he was suddenly, he didn't get it. He was one of the 12. And as one of the 12, he not getting it, betrays Jesus, or prepares to, and sets the stage for tomorrow. So stay tuned for what comes tomorrow, and communion, the Last Supper, the betrayal, the Garden of Gethsemane, and well, we'll go from there. So I want you all to stay safe tonight. I do want to add this. There's a big article in uh, the newspapers today about this big old Maui church, uh, King's Cathedral. It's huge. It sits right out there. That uh, apparently has been the site of uh, ongoing 
uh, coronavirus outbreak. And, uh, and I was looking at some of the pictures that don't look like they're all that safe. Looks like no, but not a lot of masks and not a lot of people keeping their distance and a lot of singing and shouting. So, well, that's not how we do church. That's not how we serve Jesus. That's not how we get it. The reign of God is about loving our neighbors, not infecting them, not with the coronavirus. We love God when we love our neighbor and we love our neighbor when we wear our masks. Keep our distance. Anoint them with oil and... Well, okay, from a distance, by praying for them. So, we continue to pray for you, and we will close with prayer here. Realize on Sunday, as we pray here, we keep it safe. We get it. E pule kako, let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, suffered at human hands and endured the shame of the cross. Grant that we may walk in the way of his cross and find it the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so, siblings in Christ, the Almighty God, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier, Order your days and your deeds in the divine peace. Amen.